Good afternoon everyone. This session starts with a special lecture by Dr. Suresh Babu obtained his bachelor's degree in metallurgical engineering from PSC College of Technology in the year 1986 and his master's degree in industrial welding metallurgy from Indian Institute of Technology Madras in 1988. He obtained his PhD in material science and metallurgy from University of Cambridge, UK in 1992. He worked as a research associate in the prestigious institute for Materials Research, Sendai, Japan, before joining ORNL in 1993. From 1993 to 1997, he held joint researcher position with ORNL, University of Tennessee, and the Penn State University. From 1997 to 2005, he worked as an R&D executive at ORNL. From 2005 to 2007, Dr. Suresh held a senior level technology leader position in the area of engineering and materials at Edison Welding Institute, Columbus, Ohio. From 2007 to 2013, Dr. Suresh served as professor of material science and engineering and director of NSF, IUCRC, University Cooperative Research Center for Materials Joining Science for Energy Applications at the Ohio State University. Now I kindly request Dr. Suresh Babu to handle the session. Thank you. So can you hear me in the back, in the last row? Can you show hands? You can hear me? Good. Okay. So um, usually uh, if I have a lecture after lunch, it is very hard. Okay. So I will try to keep you busy. So and then let's see. Uh, I don't think this pointer is going to work because the LED is not going to work. Yeah, to change slides, I have it. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so what I was going to do today, it's not about um, welding consumables. I'm going to talk about uh, process control and qualification for additively manufactured. So most of you must be wondering, hey, I thought I came for a welding talk and you're talking about additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is nothing but welding with complex boundary conditions. So just remember that. And this is an interdisciplinary work. Since we have a mechanical engineering and metallurgical engineering students here, so I thought it will be good to talk about this. Can you show of hands who are all mechanical engineers, my students? Okay, one, two, three, four. How about metallurgy engineers? Okay, wow, they are going to overwhelm mechanical engineers. Okay, so um, you will see the, the talk would be combination of both mechanical engineering concept and metallurgy. and. Uh, I'm supposed to show this copyright, you know, I know you can't read it, that's okay. So I have always started off with this uh, qualification certification. I did talk about it for my mechanical engineering students yesterday. So I'm going to ask my metallurgy students today. Uh, you all ate lunch today, correct? How many of you didn't eat lunch? All of you ate lunch. Did you ask for a certificate that uh, food is good? Anyone? No. The reason you didn't ask is because you trust that when you go to the PSG canteen, when you eat, you're not going to end up in hospital. The trust is there. The manufactured food is good. The same way in engineering components, also you are having qualification and certifications mainly because you build trust so that you can fly in that component or you can go in the automotive which was made by that manufacturing process. So that is the theme you will hear today about uh, qualification of metal additive manufactured components. So I have around one hour. I don't think I'll cover for one hour. I'd like to talk about a little bit about what we are doing in additive manufacturing area at UTK and ORNL, and then I'll state the goals of qualification for AM, and then I'll briefly walk you through some of the tools we are using right now, and then I'll show you a case study, since we have a lot of metallurgists here, so this is close to my heart, about controlling grain structure or a texture in nickel-based superalloy and then I'll talk about where we are going, okay? So how many of you, my student friends, have heard about additive manufacturing or 3D printing? All of you heard about it. Have you ever made 3D printed components? None, okay. So let's talk about it. It's not, it's not a big deal, okay? You'll see in a moment, okay? So what is the process flow? I'll show you a little bit. So this is a video. This is a purely cartoon. So let's say you're making a gas turbine blade and then you get a CAD geometry and then you divide the CAD geometry into different layers and then you put those layer information. It's nothing but STL files to your, and put it into the computer there and the computer controls 
an additive manufacturing machine. Here it is electron beam powder melting process. It is happening in vacuum. You put a powder layer, you heat it up with electron beam, and then you melt it up with the electron beam, and then you do post heating, and then preheat, melt, put powder, and all those things happen sequentially, and you keep dropping your powder bed, and then you can make the whole 3D component there. And that is the principle of additive manufacturing. So simple, and it is just making like a every layer of one chapati, put a chapati, and then make another one with a different shape, put it on the top, and then somehow you're able to bond between chapatis to each other, and then you make a 3D component. So think about it. That's the simplistic way of doing it. The process flow involves, as I mentioned, that is from a book by Gibson and uh, Brent Strucker and Dave Rosen. So what they show is you have a computer design file, and then you chop it up into layers, you put it, uh, condition the layers, and then put it into the machine. And in that case, it's called fused deposition modeling, where the plastic is extruded. It's like a hot glue gun, and then you do three-dimensional, you make a part, and then you cure it, and then you can get a coffee cup. So that is a kind of like a prototyping there. But here, what we are trying to do is to develop for structural application. So you must ask a question, why do we need to do this? So let me talk about it from my perspective. So I am interested in making structures or components which combines some of the functions we see in nature. So this is actually called hybrid materials. This is a concept developed by Professor Ashby. So I know you can't read in the back, so what is in the y-axis in the graph is the Young's modulus in logarithmic scale here, and this is a density in the x-axis. What you notice is naturally occurring materials will fall in groups. As an engineer, suppose my mechanical engineer wants this, and no metallurgist or material scientist is going to give you a material in that property. But what you can do is you can make those components by different forms, functions and different materials together and you can get those properties. That is called hybrid and if you have to make that component, that lattice structure, it is very, very hard to do it because you can't machine this from a component. And then one other area you can use additive manufacturing is to make components with embedded electronics. That is a process called ultrasonic additive manufacturing where we have a tapes of metal you solid state bond it by using ultrasonic seam welding, and you keep moving, and then time to time you cut out, and then you can put sensors and actuators inside. That is uh, one more application. And my colleague, Dr. Lani Lau, he's a robotics person. He likes to use additive manufacturing to mimic nature. For example, let's say I'm a robot, I have a robotic arm, and where is hydraulics? It's all inside. Where is electronic signal going from my brain? It's all inside. There's nothing is outside. If you go and see robots sitting in our welding, you can see that some of them have outside hydraulics and everything, you can see them. And in this case, what Lani did is everything is inside. That is made with the titanium, and it's also lightweight. If you put it in the water, it'll float. And that we call it White House Robot because it's very, goes to White House and comes back many times because of its uniqueness of that. And then the next one is with reference to aerospace applications. I think we heard in the morning too, when um, we in the ISRO, they want to make a big comp, uh, small component, they'll take a forged component and then they'll machine it and make a tiny little uh, bracket or so. So you're wasting material. So they call it by one kilogram, fly one gram. So the by to fly ratio is the, what uh, bothers most of the aerospace up industries. So by doing additive manufacturing, you can avoid the waste. So these are the reasons why you would go about doing additive manufacturing. But is it easy? No. So at ORNL and UTK, we have a four areas of ongoing research. We focus on developing new materials. We also talk about process science. We test out the material properties, what is the thermophysical properties, and also do design called topology optimization. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we also characterize the process under in situ and ex situ condition. What do I mean by that? While you are welding or while you are making, you can have a cameras to look at a thermal or a displacement or chemistry, and we do that characterization too. And then finally, most of the additive manufacturing have a size limitation. Let's say you want to make a large scale structure. Can you do it? And that is an area where we are working on a system level 
to make large scale components by additive manufacturing. So these are the wide range of activities at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab in UTK. I will not talk about all of them. I will tell you a little bit of uh, how we are using the two process signs and then get the properties we want. Okay. So I already told you uh, additive manufacturing is nothing but welding. So let's talk about welding for a moment. So if you are driving a car, the cars have spot wells. The spot wells have been designed for absorbing a lot of energy in case of a crash. So there is a lot of design goes inside. It is a mature topic. So we know how to design spot wells. In addition to that, we also do process modifications. And that simulation for a gas tungsten arc welding with the magnetic field we oscillated and then we can kind of churn the melt pool and then those lines, black lines you are see seeing are computational fluid dynamics vectors and with that you can actually describe what is happening at the boundary between liquid and solid. So my metallurgy students and friends, you should know that when you, when you change the liquid solid interface, you can either get columnar grain structure or equax to grain structure and that is one of the things about welding too. In addition to that, once you welded it, you put it in a service and they degrade most of the time and because we are always in a metastable condition when you put it in a high temperature service, slowly but steadily the material system is moving towards equilibrium. We can call that as a material degradation or moving towards equilibrium. So in that case, we have a stellite cladding on top of a steel and then one of them failed because of alternating loads in a gas turbine engine. So we understand that too. And if you have all those information, we can actually put it together as a computational tool and we do have a verification and validation for computational well mechanics. So if there's so much knowledge exists, why can't we use it in additive manufacturing and then right away deploy products? The challenge comes because if you are doing traditional manufacturing, one person does the design, he gives it to somebody else who goes and procures the material, who manufactured, you can see complex process flow and supply chain is there. But in the case of additive manufacturing, you need to have everything in one single space. For example, you need to know how to design for additive manufacturing. Also, you need to know what kind of process you need to select. And then you need to know how to control the process. And then you need to know when I make this geometry, will I get the same geometry? It's all not science and technology. There is a lot of art goes with that. Those who operate these machines know more about than me. And then the next thing, since we are doing layer by layer, it gives you one more flexibility of changing microstructure each and every location. And then we can also, you need to remember that these have to be qualified. If I make one component, doesn't mean that if I reproduce the component, the properties are going to be the same. So we need to think about that too. And finally, you need to make a technical and a business case for adopting additive manufacturing. I'll give you one reason for that. If I buy a powder per pound, it could be $150 for titanium. But if you are making very traditional machining, those um, finished component could be cheaper than the powder itself. So you have to remember why you're using additive manufacturing and you need to make a business case for that. Okay, so that's what we focus on it. Let me uh, take around 10 minutes or so and walk you through each one of those challenges and show you what are the tools we have. One, let's talk about topology optimization. My mechanical engineering students must have been exposed to that. In this case, if I have a cantilever structure like this and you know that or not all the material is going to be stressed, so what you can do is you can remove some of the material and then you can get the topologically optimized structure. It will be low weight and also give you the same performance as a solid component. And this is not new and actually Airbus and Altair, Altair is a software company, Airbus is a, a aerospace company and they actually uh, designed a door hinge which in a plane going from one material to other material and also topology optimized. They, showcase that additive manufacturing is a good way to make that hinge. And right now, these tools are available for all the students for free. You can go and download a software called Inspire, and you can actually go from a solid block of a component all the way to topology optimized component, and then you can test it out. And this work was done by my uh, senior undergraduate student, Sean Yoder, now he's doing masters. And he actually demonstrated with this group 
that by doing topology optimized, we can actually get the same amount of uh, stress uh, loading requirements for the reduced weight also. That was done with the titanium 6Al4 vanadium. Okay, good. Let's say you made this component, you're repeating that. Is there any way to know that I'm doing the same thing? So to do that, you have a ways to measure what you're doing in additive manufacturing process. In remember, in the electron beam powder melting, you saw the electron beam rastering. That means it's defined by accelerating voltage and current. And it's also done in a vacuum. That means you need to know what is the gun, gun pressure where the electrons are generated, and then the chamber pressure, and also the backing pressure. All of them are measured too, and you can get that information. In addition to that, while you're building, there is a substrate plate, and then you have a temperature underneath that's also tracked. All those informations are done, tracked in millisecond interval in this machine. So I love this machine because it gives you all the information what it did. And uh, if you have a time series data, I think probably in second year or third year, you might have heard about called fast Fourier transform. You can actually do that and then you can get a spectral response. You see it on the rightmost there. And then you can use that as a signature. And uh, whenever I show that, my students have a real trouble. I don't know whether how many of you carry a mobile phone and then you hear this song and then you ask the mobile to figure out, have you done it before? It's a software called Sashom. You can actually say, hey, what song it is. Behind the things, that's what it is doing, spectral response and then finding for identification. So you can use similar techniques to figure out whether it's good or bad also when you're doing additive manufacturing. So not only that, when you are putting some energy into the material, it's heating. So you can actually figure out when you are doing this additive manufacturing, what is the background temperature before each layer is built. In a welding terminology, it is sensing nothing but preheat. So for doing that, we can actually have a camera called near infrared, and that is actually loaded on top of this RCAM machines. And what you're seeing in the video is uh, gray, bright and dark regions are corresponding to different background temperatures. We are building layer by layer. At each and every layer, before you build one, you take a snapshot. It tells you what is the background temperature. So that's what it is going through. And then you, you can use this information to figure out what is happening to material. So let me, let's think, show you the, the real significance of this data, okay? So currently, the industries, when they're doing additive manufacturing component, they will make a component, which is done by welding, and then they'll put tensile samples all around this complicated component, and then they'll test the tensile sample, and if the tensile sample passes, you can pass the complex object. So is it a valid hypothesis? Let's talk about that. So I'm going to show you a video. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a near infrared. Blue means cold, red means hot. And I am building those complex geometry over there. And you can see that it's uh, buried inside here. And then I'm also putting tensile samples all around it. So you remember, what is my hypothesis? If I test a tensile test, if it works, that complex geometry should work. So let's see, in this case, you'll see the, uh, I pulled out those tensile samples and pointing out there. And you can see uh, there are many tensile samples are not preheated to the same level as other ones. I want you to remember so number two and number seven right now. So let's see what happens there. So the next slide, you'll see the video of number two and number seven alone. I removed all those complicated components there. So let's look at it, okay? So now it starts. What you will see is number seven will remain hot throughout the building. Every layer, it starts up with a high temperature, but whereas the number two, it's cold, always starts cold, and time to time, you will see a bright regions go by on your left-hand side, and that is actually nothing but porosities forming. So this uh, infrared data can actually pick up those porosities, and then you can see that number seven uh, actually has this, uh, um, number two has this kind of porosities because it's cold. So by the time my industry friends will say, okay, this is esoteric, I don't, I don't know why you're using this, what is a big deal? So what, let's look at this hypothesis we have. So we took the toast tensile samples and then we did the room temperature tensile testing. What you see on the uh, diagram there is the ultimate tensile strength, nothing but you go beyond yield point, it just fractures at point, that is the ultimate tensile strength. And then we can look at the elongation at the, for the same level 
what you noticed is the sample which was called all the time had a lower elongation whereas the number seven has very good strength and also very good elongation. That clearly shows that hypothesis of tensile test uh, showing the similar property is not good because each and every uh, tensile sample goes through a different thermal signature. So the, the way I would explain this, if you are making a dosa in a griddle, let's say you're making two dosas, one side is hot, one side is cold, one side is going to get burnt really bad, other one will be undercooked. So the same way this is happening in additive manufacturing because we have quite a lot of different thermal signature. This is a snapshot. Let's say I want a temporal response while I am building that one single layer. Can we do that? Yes, indeed, we can do it. This is not new because welders actually known this for a long time. They actually put infrared cameras and that's what you're seeing here, that video where we have a high speed infrared camera looking at as the electron beam melts the whole layer and you can actually, if you have a, each and every pixel there, you can see what is the heating and cooling in that pixel as a function of time, you can get those information on that. So for doing that, what we have to do is we have to jerry-rig the uh, additive manufacturer, put a hole there and put an infrared camera which is actually flare camera which gives you the temperature distribution there. Okay. So there are a lot of innovation went into it. If you are very much interested in how, what is that uh, contraption, we can talk about in the Q&A. So now we have a thermal signature. So what you have a thermal signature? So what we do is we can use the thermal signature to figure out whether you are going to create porosity in that location or not. So you can actually, you can develop an algorithm and then using the thermal imaging, you can actually say, okay, that location you will have a porosity. And that is what's shown here on your left hand side video. That is actually a three dimensional ima uh, voxel by voxel imaging of the tendency for forming porosity. And then we took the same sample and then looked at it ex situ after processing, looking at the tomography. And you can do one to one correlation and then you can develop some algorithms to figure out whether what I call as a porosity during in situ imaging, is it going to end up as a porosity? You must ask a question, why is that? Why are you worried about it? So let's say you're cooking one layer, if you put another layer which you called as a defects could be healed by the time when the n plus one layer comes. So we need to come up with some algorithms to take care of that. So with this information right now, my colleague Ryan Dehoff can actually produce porosities anywhere in the build on demand. So that's what he can do. Okay, so now you must be thinking, okay, so as you talked about qualification of AM component, okay, got taken care of porosity. What about the microstructure? So I'm going to switch gears. I don't have a data showing from a millimeter level to nanometer level in this process, but I have got the data from another process called laser power blown technique. That's what is shown here. So this is actually, a titanium sample over there and then you're actually repairing them with, sorry, not titanium, this is in this case 718 and then you're repairing them and what you notice over here is the texture of face centered cubic structure and not the BCC over there, it's an FCC structure and red means they're all aligned on over one, over one direction, zero, zero, one direction and as you go up, you can see the colors are showing up. That means the crystals are misoriented with reference to build direction. And we know why that happens. It's because of thermal gradient is becoming shallower as you go up. So this is like uh, if you have a big plate, this big substrate, if I put a small heat source, it'll cool faster. If I made a thin uh, wall like this, and then if you put a heat on the top of the wall, it takes a lot more time to go down. So the thermal gradient will be shallow on the top and thermal gradient will be steep on the bottom. That's the reason we get totally different texture. Okay, so now solidification. So as a metallurgist, we need to worry about what happens to this alloy during cooling down. So in fact, you can look at the decomposition of this FCC into precipitates. That also happens. So you can see that, how do I know? This is a hardness uh, distribution. I think Ramesh showed you in the morning we do each and every small intervals, you can do a hardness indent, you can measure it, you can put it in image format. 
you can see that in the case of uh, near the bottom you have a hard region near the top you have a soft region that is mainly because in the hard in the bottom regions because of thermal signature you kick started the precipitate on the top it, you didn't kick start you get soft microstructure there are a lot of in depth analysis went into transmission electron microscope i'm really happy you have a tem around the corner you can do the same thing here and then you can, we can look at the atomic level called atom probe. If you want to do that, you can go to IIT Madras and or IAC. You can get that kind of information too. So this shows how the microstructure is evolving. But however, we cannot do this comprehensively for additive manufacturing component because it's too expensive. Each one is around thousand dollars, which you can see it becomes totally exorbitant to make the whole comprehensive measurement. But you can use this information to validate computational models. Okay, now what is the next problem we have? So whenever you process welding or anything, you have a called residual stress, which is nothing but when you put material in heating up, you get a thermal stress. When you have a thermal stress, locally you initiate plastic deformation. So now you cool back down, those plastic strain you created is not annulled, so it's actually accumulates that accumulated plastic strain and that gradient gives you the residual stress and this is pure mechanics and you see that happening in during additive manufacturing but you can make an influence on them for example if you do electron beam process you're doing at a very high preheat so the thermal gradient is shallow when the thermal gradient is shallow you don't have a lot of stress you don't have a lot of plastic deformation so your residual stress is actually low. You can see that it's only plus or minus 90 megapascal. But if you're doing laser process, even though you're putting less amount of energy in each and every location, but you're cooling down very, very fast, you create a lot of thermal stress, you also create a lot of deformation, and because of that, you get huge amount of residual stress. Again, we measure this using a technique called neutron diffraction, Every time you have a material, you can't run to this. So we have to use this model to calibrate our computational models. Okay, there is a one more problem, okay? So if you are doing additive manufacturing, you can't throw away the powders, you have to reuse them. In this case, is a titanium sample. I want you to see this on the rightmost graph on the bottom is a stress strain diagram of the blue one is a new powder you get from the manufacturer and then you processed it and then you took the same powder and redid the same process and you will see it gains strength. The reason why it gains strength is because it picks up oxygen. If a titanium picks up oxygen, it stabilizes alpha, which is an SCP structure, and then you get a little bit more hardening there. So now you have to remember, so you have to make sure that every time your incoming material is changing your uh, composition. It's same as making chapati. If you left the dough a little bit, it'll dry out. You can't roll it. Same way the material feedstock is degrading as you use it also. Okay, so by this time, you must be wondering what else you can do. So we are going to use computational models to describe these thermal signatures, and we'll see what we can do with this. So let me talk about the first thing about solidification. As I told, it's nothing but weld. And you can see a melt pool is moving, similar to a weld pool. You're melting on a surface. And this is called oxen path. It's oxen is nothing but plowing a field. I don't know how many of you seen that you plow and then go back and forth, back and forth. That's what you're doing with electron beam here. So the point here is, look at this melt pool. It's kind of oscillating as soon as it goes to the end and comes back. And there is a, as a function of places, the melt pool size is changing. But as you know, there is not one unique way to fill the space. I will challenge you if you show me that. It's not possible. You can take a paper and then you can fill it up many ways you can do it. So there are other ways to do it. In this case, you can do a spiral path and then you can do a hill bed path. So there are many ways to fill, and every time you change the path sequence, look at the melt pool shape. They're all changing. So you must be wondering, why do I care about it? So you will see in a moment, that actually controls your solidification grain size and also solidification texture, and that has a huge effect on your properties. Okay, so this is for solidification. How about residual stress and distortion? The residual stress and distortion 
usually accumulates at a low temperature below the recrystallization temperature. So you don't need to do this kind of very detailed analysis. So you can do some cheating. So cheating is following. You put all the energy into a membrane. It's like a hot towel and then you put it on the geometry and then every layer you put this hot towel and take it, hot towel and take it. So you can do it in a computational model. So that is what is being done here by my collaborator, Professor Pavana Prabhagar from Wisconsin. So what she's done is that by doing that energy going in a layer by layer, you can actually melt and then see how the distortion occurs at low temperature also. And uh, you, she can see, actually predict that uh, displacement. You can see here, this distortion you can actually predict. And uh, most of the time, my students uh, actually wonder, why bother? That is only small few millimeters. Why do you worry about it? So let's talk about this. Actually, that actually is called $10,000 problem. The reason is, when you're building this layer by layer, let's say your material actually de uh, deforms. When you deform, you have a rake which spends the powder which will hit this uh, substrate or the part you made it. And every time you hit it, there's a build failure, so you need to stop and restart. Whenever you stop and restart, it's around $5,000 to $10,000 of waste of powder and everything. So by using this computational model, simple model in Abacus, you can actually predict the distortion. Okay, so what we are doing is putting all those information into a, a three-dimensional canister in a software, and you can actually do a call similar to what we had in the morning, correlative microscopy. Here you can do correlative numerical microscopy. That means you have all the information about a 3D object. You can see, hey, there is a porosity there. What is the local conditions there? And then you can get an understanding about the defect formation and microstructure formation. So this is a work we are doing in collaboration with Air Force uh, Research Lab on this. So I'll tell you why that is important, okay? So let's see an example here. So what is shown on your um, x-axis is the number of pores, and then on the other side is the layer processing time. And what you are seeing is the red one is the layer time, and then this, the green ones are actually the number of pores in each and every layer. So what they did is while uh, they wanted to evaluate the system, say so they put an the engineer defects at around um, around 13 millimeter from the bottom, okay? That's what they did. And then while they're doing it, in additive manufacturing, we do call nesting of parts. So there are many parts that are there. Some of the parts will go away. So what happens is when the layer time drops and then you get humongous amount of the pores. Whenever I show this graph, many times people have a trouble understanding this. So I'm going to give you a little bit of um, uh, similar analogy for that. If you play, I don't know how many of you played a game called SimCity. I don't know. Have you ever played my students? Oh, most of you have played it. Okay. So remember, you put a, a substrate, you build. Okay. Let's say in a town, you have, first thing you're doing is building two-story houses. And then you had to spend a lot of time building all those two-story houses. And then uh, after all the clients of the two-story customers, still you're building uh, the high-rise uh, buildings too. But you'll go to the high-rise building. There are a few high-rise buildings. So you will come back quickly building for high-rise buildings. So they will keep going up. So the time between you come and visit the same location will be different. And this is the beauty of additive manufacturing and also the challenge of the additive manufacturing. So you can see how this correlative numerical analysis will tell you where the defects are forming. Okay, so what do we do? We do all this kind of capability development. We put it in our book, a roadmap, or anything, we give it to industries. So this is a time my industry friends will say, Suresh, this is great. You have all the tools you're developing. It's like having a Porsche in your garage. You're not driving it. We, we don't see the use of this. So I always had to follow up with a case study. So I'm going to show you that right now. So let's talk about this case study. Um, let me set the stage for my metallurgy students. So one of the biggest challenge or a dream for metallurgists is following. I have a component, and let's say a gas turbine component, and you have a blade. At the very close to the shaft, you have a very high stress, but the temperature is low. And as the, when you go up towards the periphery, where there is a lot of combustion is occurring, the temperature is high, but the stress is low. But now you can see you can't have one single material 
or you have to make one material capable of surviving in both operating conditions. So this has been one of the dream for metallurgists to have a different grain structure at different locations on that. There are ways to do it, but it's very cumbersome. Either you have to use a complex thermomechanical treatment to trigger recrystallization in one location. It's been a pain in the backside to do it. So is there any way we can do this in additive manufacturing? May, the reason is we are building layer by layer. You can change the conditions each and every layer so we can get called site-specific microstructure. So this is a, a hypothesis. Can we do that? So I'm going to describe my, one of my students' PhD thesis here. This is Narendra Raghavan. He uh, graduated from MIT near uh, uh, Chennai, that is uh, Madras Institute of Technology. So he's actually an electrical and communication engineer. I have to convert them into a metallurgist. So you'll see in a moment what we did. Okay, the first thing we need to understand what is really happening in the melt pool. Let me take a little bit of time to set the stage. So let's say that blue is a melt pool moving, remember, on this substrate. And if you shrink yourself in atomic level and then walk along that, you will see on one side hot region, on the other side is the cold region. So if I know the distance, I can actually delta T by delta X will give you a thermal gradient. And then this melt pool is moving at a velocity given by the, let's say, the beam. For, take it for a moment, the beam velocity. But however, on the sides, actually, they are moving much different velocities. So the velocity at the, all along this melt pool will not be the same. And this is the beauty of weld pool solidification. You get the different magnitudes of thermal gradient, which we call it G, and different magnitudes of liquid solid interface R. So the G and R are varying across the melt pool. If I know an idea of that, I can actually say what kind of solidification will occur. So this is not new. It's if you go to a casting book, that's what described. Actually, you can go and read Professor Kurs's book. It'll tell you you can modify the grain structure. So around 2014, we didn't have those computational models. My colleague Ryan Dehoff, what he did is, remember he could do site-specific porosity. He said that why don't I try it on crystallographic texture control. So what he did is he changed his beam scanning conditions to write down DOE, that is Department of Energy. So he wanted to make a misoriented growth in the, within the D, within the O, within the E, surrounded by highly textured 001 growth of the SCC. He was successful, but he was not completely successful because you can see the red color bleeds into uh, over in between these regions too. So he wasn't very perfect. The reason is that was done by trial and error method. So we didn't have a priori computational model to describe what we want. Okay, so this was a problem given to Narain. He said that Suresh, it's too difficult to handle powder and everything, so let me make some assumptions. So what he did is, since we are only putting 50 micron, but every time you deposit electron beam, you actually melt around 250 micron into the depth, so I'm going to throw away the powder effect for a moment. So that's correct, because if there's a powder, there's a thermal diffusivity is very low, so we can ignore that. And then he said the next thing is, since we are doing quite a lot of transient analysis, I'm going to throw away my fluid dynamics, and I'm only going to do transient heat transfer analysis. So this is similar to putting a small heat on the top of substrate, and then see how the melt pool collapses. That's what he did. Okay, why is he doing that? If he knows the thermal gradient in R, liquid solid interface velocity, he can actually predict what is happening in the solidification. So I'm going to walk you through this for my metallurgy friends here. So if you have a phase diagram, T versus C, so you would expect equilibrium conditions uh, that if you're coming down here, that's where the solid will form. But that is assuming at a very low velocity. But what would happen if the velocity is increasing so that it'll, the interface will never be planar, it'll create dendrites, and then the, you need to worry about the dendrite tip temperature, and that actually goes through the up and down, because of the instability criteria. So if you have a solidification book, go and look for this magical two people, Mullins and Sikarika. They actually developed the theory for that. So now what happens at very high velocity, you would see 
that you will actually again go back to planar growth because instability cannot be maintained. So this theory exists. The most critical important information there is thermal gradient and liquid solid interface velocity. Okay, let's use this. So if I have an, an alloy system, I can actually predict this solidification map. So let me walk you through what it really means. So in the y-axis here is logarithmic of thermal gradient. So you're going from 10 to the power 2 k per meter to 10 to the power 6 k per meter on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the liquid solid interface velocity that is moving from 10 to the power minus 5 meters per second to 10 to the power 0 meters per second, that is 1 meters per second. And you can use those theories and then you can tell which conditions you will get a columnar growth and which conditions you will get equaxed growth. So it's good, we have a diagram. So this uh, I saw, I hope you saw the video run by to show that I'm not lying, actually I did these calculations. So you can see that if you are over here, you'll get columnar, if you are here, you'll get an equivax structure. If you understand the heat transfer, steady state welding, that is hard to do it because these are few orders of magnitude variation in thermal gradient and liquid solid interface velocity. What do we do about it? So this is an issue, okay? So we started scratching our head and then we went back to the literature in welding and this is also welders have thought about it. So let me explain to you for a moment. So let's say you have a huge chunk of metal, okay? You can go and do your experiment in your workshop, take a, a gas tungsten arc welding, and then you strike an arc and then stop. So let's say slow down the uh, time, okay? When you strike an arc, what will happen is there is an energy you are putting on the top of the substrate. The, as long as the energy is there, the heat transfer occurs to the substrate. The material, the solid material will become liquid. Let's say it just starts growing, a big liquid pool will form, big in, with reference to atoms. So this big liquid pool will form. And then you switch off the arc, and then this pool will collapse. The, when you are collapsing, what will happen is initially the velocity is zero because you have a balance between heat coming and heat going out. And then when the energy goes out, the velocity is actually accelerating. And then when it is accelerating, the liquid solid interface velocity can take many orders of magnitude. So that's what's shown here. And you can see uh, here the, on the, your y-axis here is the thermal gradient. And then the x-axis is the liquid solid interface velocity. Wait, 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 wait. I had to go back. So here, and you can see that velocity actually increases rapidly towards the collapse of the melt pool. So that means you can actually access those many orders of difference in G and R by initiating called a spot melting condition. So I, this is again very difficult to explain to my students, so I actually give a little bit of very um, uh, example. Let's say you have a machine gun, and then you have a target which is a square target, and then you're essentially to fill up the square target, you're actually firing each bullet at each and every location. So think of that each bullet is like a spot melt. You're doing that, okay? So now the question comes is, okay, how fast I have to fire this bullet? And then what is the distance between this bullet? So that is nothing but what is the time on for the arc spot and what is the distance between the spot? So this is needs supercomputing because it takes a lot of time to do transient heat transfer analysis. So that is what uh, Narain did. So when the spots are very close to each other, that is the bullets are close to each other, it creates the big melt pool. And then if you change the distances, now you can see then you will form individual melt pools also. By doing this, you can control the thermal gradient and liquid solid interface velocity. So first thing um, Narain did is, Suresh, I can't go into this column not the equax, let me demonstrate whether this will take me to control of the grain size. So can I do that first? I said, okay, do it. So he ran numerical experiment and then came up with the process parameters and then he used the process parameters to make experimental builds. In the same build, he could go from a very coarse columnar grain 
to a very fine columnar grain. You can see that cube one to cube eight, he modified the grain size. Remember, there was no trial and error experiments. He did the modeling, came up with the process parameter, and then implemented, and then he saw this grain structure. Okay, so remember, I told him, your thesis, I'll only sign if you show me that you can do columnar to equax transition. So he took the challenge, he did more experiments, so he has to, he understood one fundamental concept. The computational models is a tool, but you need to have a concept. So what he said is, how can I reduce the thermal gradient further? The way you would do that is increase the preheat. So that means make sure the spot melting is occurring with already higher preheat. So he modified the beam scanning strategies. So it's similar to probably increasing your firing rate on the substrate so that you don't see individual spots probably make a big melt pool, and that is how you can control the thermal gradient. So he came up with, uh, again, a new set of processing conditions, and then he implemented on a cube geometry. So he showed that if I do that, the cube eight processing parameter, which is known already, that you get this uh, columnar grain structure, this is a build direction, and when he goes into this modified spot melting pattern, you get highly misoriented uh, texture in the sample in the same build in the different areas there. So with that, he demonstrated that it is indeed possible to go from a columnar to equivax grain structure. This is, remember, this is a dream of a metallurgist on demand on a sample which you are making. So then, the, you know, the next question I always have to ask is, uh, okay, it's great, you're doing in a cube. What happens, can I use the same processing parameter to a totally different geometry? Can you do that? So he said, okay, I'll be back, Suresh. So he did uh, go and repeat the experiment, the same processing condition. He actually told me it won't work. I'll tell you why. So he used the same processing condition for a, from a small cube to a big cube. Guess what? The whole thing changed. Again, it reverted back to columnar grain structure, which is kind of expected. If you have a small block and then you put a lot of heat, it's going to cool slow. But if you have a big block, if you put the same amount of heat, you can see that it disperses very quickly because like a heat sink and it went back to higher thermal gradient conditions and then he got back his equax grain structure. So what clearly Narendra um, educated me is following. If you are doing additive manufacturing, the processing conditions, materials, and geometry are coupled together. You can't separate them at all. So that's what he showed. Now we understood this. So now we started pushing our boundaries of this idea into uh, other areas where how we can change the thermal gradient. So remember this, um, firing uh, bullets, so we do it here right now. So the, you will see these two cubes uh, in a way. Uh, in one case, I am actually uh, lower time, and then the cube 16, I'm spending a little bit more time, so that means spot on time. What you will see is in the cube 16, each and every individual melt pool will join together and make a big lake of molten pool. So when you have a big lake of molten pool, your alarm bells in your head should go up. That is low thermal gradient, and this is high thermal gradient. So by doing this subtle changes in your melt sequences, you can go from a high thermal gradient to low thermal gradient. Can we get the same thing? Sure. You can actually go from a columnar to equivax structure by changing subtle differences in the spot melting pattern. So the reason why that happens is clear. You can actually do this modeling uh, that work clearly shows the cube 16, most of the data points actually lie below the equax grain structure, whereas the one cube 15 sits on the blue area, which is columnar structure. So now you can see how modeling is allowing it, us to come up with a different scan strategies to figure out how to control the microstructure. So this is a time. I had another student, he said that, okay, Suresh, this is all great, we are still making cubes. Can we make in a complex geometry? So that's what uh, Jake Rapley uh, worked on it. So, but however, when he was doing, he said that I don't, 
I agree modeling helps you and everything, but I like to understand the stochastic nature of the real thing, what's going on. Is it exactly like the line you see, or there is a spatter, scatter of the properties there? Can I look at it? So you put infrared imaging, you remember I showed you earlier, and then he implemented this pattern on a complex geometry. And then he collected uh, information at each and every layer, and then he did the analysis, so that became his master's thesis. So let's see that, what he did. So this is what we are building. It's a complicated uh, structure. It's nothing, it's just a small bracket. And you can see that the square area is where we implemented this rapid uh, firing spot melt pattern, so which creates a low uh, thermal gradient. And everywhere else, we used the same stationary, the, uh, like an oxen path for melting. And then we did move into column not EQX. Whenever I show this plot, many people ask me a question, Suresh, it doesn't make any sense. You have a lot of data points, even in the red one over here, so that means it should be columnar. I want you to point out that this is actually not a histogram, so there are many more points below the equax. You don't see it in this diagram there. If you happen to put a histogram, you will see a lot more data points in the, below the equax region also. So did we get the microstructure control? Yes, indeed. Uh, in those uh, square locations, you can see equax grain structure. Away from that, you get a nice columnar grain structure. Many people don't believe optical microscopes, so we had to do EBSD. We did the electron backscatter diffraction imaging. We confirmed that even in a complicated geometry, you can get these kind of structures too. So this clearly shows that solidification theories developed by casting is still relevant. You need to understand the heat transfer. So if you're a metallurgist, work with a mechanical engineer who knows the heat transfer, work together to figure out what happens in additive manufacturing too. So we have taken this to other alloy system. I don't have time. I'm not going to talk about that. So the case study essentially showed you that the geometry, processing condition, materials are tightly coupled for additive manufacturing. There is no way to separate. In welding, we could get away because geometries are very fixed. We don't have so much variability in the geometry. Okay, where do you want to go next? As a metallurgist, I want to understand a little bit further because all the theories which I showed you, the data was collected under zero thermal gradient. That means in isothermal conditions. Is it valid, those properties for this huge variations of thermal gradient? We don't know that. So we need to understand the interfaces between liquid and solid, solid and solid, that you need to do a very detailed analysis using experiment and also in situ measurements in synchrotron. That is ongoing, so we need to focus on that. The next thing is from the application point of it, you can actually learn, because it's similar to welding, now you can actually use a robot and the welding and make a large scale structure. This is, we are doing it for an excavator system we built the whole thing, but we were not doing trial and error. We did a computational model, predicted the distortion, we used the same processing parameter. It may look continuous, don't believe that. They actually, we need to stop many times. If you're welding gas metal arc welding, you know there are a lot of issues with the reference to wire feeding, we need to take care of that. Where we want to go is following. Now, since you can do welding, you can have multiple welding consumables, so you can have transition properties across the whole thing. Okay, the last but not least, we also need to uh, work on f solid state one. I did talk about this is called ultrasonic additive manufacturing where you're not fusing materials, you're not melting, so instead you're doing solid state welding. In this case, we demonstrated creating of a control plate for a high flux isotope reactor, which the cost is actually one fourth and the time is actually very two weeks compared to 12 weeks. So you can do this, you can make large scale structures. There are a lot of fundamental issues. So that one is actually Neanth, is my student working on it, and then he's trying to understand the nanoscale level, what is happening to oxides and everything. So uh, at this time, I was asked to, let's see, I have around three, five, we started around, uh, can I have five minutes, indulge? Is it okay? So I want to show you the, for the students are here, I'd like to show some of your PhD tech students who are working with me. So this is Neanth. Uh, he graduated metallurgy program and now he's actually 
as um, a staff member at Oak Ridge National Lab. He's a scientist. He focuses on additive manufacturing and uh, works on a lot of microscopy tools. He's already plugged into a lot of programs there also. And um, the next one is Mohan. He's actually working on transition joints. He's interested in creep of materials with the different dissimilar materials we're creating. So he's the one who set up my creep mission lab. And then he's also using digital image correlation. And he also is digging deeper into the mechanisms of the creep also. So that is him. And then the new addition is Sabina. And she's actually working on looking at steels, looking at microstructure evolution in steels, and then using a lot of characterization techniques. So I, I didn't ask them to, I asked them, what do you want to convey? That's what the, she all wrote, everything. I just put it as it is, OK? And then the last but not least, Vignesh is just joined also. He's also working on steels, too. So as you can see, all of them came from PSG Tech, so from our metallurgy department. So good training, so OK? With that, I'd like to summarize today. What I wanted to talk to you today is additive manufacturing has a, a complicated process flow, but everything is compressed into one single thing. That means you need to go from design process, process selection controls, optimization of beam scan, materials, property, all of them has to be done quickly. It's not easy. You, you could do it. Physics is not new. All the underlying physics have been developed in 1960s. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel, just understand them and then build on them on top of them. So if you can combine in situ monitoring, computational modeling, work with the equipment manufacturers, indeed you can do this uh, process based qualification. I would fly a component, I will not do detailed testing with those kind of components too. I hope I proved you with a case study. And challenge to my students here would be take additive manufacturing. This is like uh, I would always say that I don't know how many of you used landline. I, when I was young, we had to wait in the line to get a landline in India. So we actually flipped from a landline to mobile phone. All of you carry one or two mobile phones. We can actually, additive manufacturing is a way to democratize size the manufacturing. You don't need to have a huge infrastructure. You can buy an additive manufacturing machine if you know where the application and technical case, in, even a, a student, undergraduate student, can start up a company and get into business. With that, I'll close my talk. The session is open for queries. Any questions? No questions? OK. See? Not even my students who don't want to start a company? Anyone? OK. If not, I'll, is there anything else? Any questions? No? They're all shy, I guess. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'll stop. Thank you, sir. I now kindly request Dr. J. Krishnamurthy, Assistant Professor, Department of Metallurgical Engineering, PRZ College of Technology, to give away a memento as a token of gratitude to Dr. Sudarsanam Suresh Babu.